I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, here live and unscripted in a real life operating room. And when people come into this room here, there are four types of people. Which one are you? The first type of patient is the fighter. And you probably know who I'm talking about. These are often college students. We colloquially call them the frat boy who comes in is like, I'm going to fight the anesthesia till the bitter end. You're never going to get me. Then there are the redheads and they're their own special group. Not special in a bad way, just because there are some differences culturally, maybe physiologically, we don't yet know. But yeah, some of their anesthesia requirements are a little bit different. And then there are are the Zen masters. I call them the Jedis. When they come in this room, they are so relaxed and they're in control. They have a presence that the whole operating room staff can feel. And then there is the fourth type of patient. I call them sometimes the silent crying patient. The patient that some people might refer to as the meltdown patient. Not in a rude way, but because of what happens to so many patients. When they come in to a scary room like this, when it is cold, when they are hungry, when they don't know what's gonna to happen to them on this table. And there's that silent crier that breaks my heart. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I see everyone on here, Linda, Heidi, Chris, Steph, Kim, hello everyone. And yes, like, like Heidi, I wanna be that Jedi as well. So what happens to the patient who comes in. Well, let me share a story because when a patient comes on, actually not too long ago, a patient came in a room just like this. They were so talkative in pre-op. They were making jokes. They were comfortable speaking with everyone. And then they came right to the edge of the door, right on to the edge. When you come in this door, everything changes because you enter a crisis mode because we are pushed to our limits when we're uncertain. And since most patients have never seen this room before, it's a tremendous state of uncertainty. They're going to get a medication that they've never heard of before. And something opens up within them. When this patient had this experience of this unknown suddenly washing over them, they became super silent. So they walked through the door, all of a sudden, it's like night and day difference. They silently walked over to this table and sat down on it, just like I'm sitting down on it right now, put their head back towards me, and I sensed there was something going on, right? So I asked, hey, what, well, how are you feeling? Is everything okay? And they just nod, and you see these tears just silently rolling down the side of their face. And you of course, they're concerned, are they in pain? You know, patients are having often surgery for pain. Maybe it was painful for them walking and getting on the bed, but they just shake their head and, and this streams of tears slowly going down the side of their face. Now, I don't want this to sound dramatic, right? It's not about dramatizing or victimizing. It's about recognizing what happens within, within us because everyone is subject to this. But some of us, can react differently. Some of us have a sense of resilience that we're able to tap into. And I want to share with you what happened to that patient and what other patients can do to hopefully prevent falling asleep with that level of emotional distress. Because how we fall asleep probably has an impact on how the surgery goes, how we, I should say, respond to the surgery, and probably has an impact on how we wake up. Like Scott says, I also want to be the Jedi patient as well. And I believe that many of them often do better from a physiological, meaning their physical body, and a psychological perspective when they fall asleep like that because of how they wake up and how the rest of their surgery recovery goes, like surgical site infection risk, risk of blood clots, frozen joints, etc. So this patient, we actually, their head came down right around here. And I gave them the oxygen mask and they didn't say anything. It was just nodding, shaking their head. Yes, no answers to my questions. And as we fell asleep, um, this particular patient didn't need much more. I, I suspect they probably couldn't sleep the night before. And as you probably know from my other videos, 
The more tired one is when they come to the operating room, typically the less anesthesia they need. Not always, but in many cases, like emergency surgeries in the middle of the night for many reasons, but perhaps one additional reason is that patients are, um, patients are already halfway asleep. This particular patient, I suspect it was exhausted. I mean, how many of you have, um, if you've had surgery before, were anxious before falling asleep? And maybe you had insomnia, very, very common. So as the patient fell asleep, normal anesthetic, anesthetic dose, uh, there was this rapid rebound when the actual surgical incision happened. They went from this calm state to this super active vitals. Now this can be for many reasons. It could be from an underdose of the anesthetic. Maybe the surgical stimulation was, not, was too much for the amount of anesthesia they were getting. But this patient also had depression and anxiety and were taking many medications that, as we've talked about before, might influence how much anesthesia you need and how your body reacts to the anesthesia when you're on this table. So we gave it, obviously, the correct amount of anesthesia needed. They woke up, however, crying and sobbing and in tears. So, of course, this is an anecdote, but ask any anesthesiologist or any surgeon or any nurse who's worked in the operating room for enough years, and this pattern appears very reproducible. So, what can we do to help prevent this from happening? I see everyone's comments here about some people have had similar types of experiences, some never had an experience like this, but certainly throughout your lifetime, if you live in the Western world, you will know somebody who has surgery, who has to come into a room like this, and is going to be subject to these same types of stressors. So first off, what is a stressor that pushes us to our limit? I said earlier, you come into this room, you're hungry because you haven't eaten since midnight, you're cold because the operating rooms are cold, you're uncertain about what's going to happen. Whenever we are having an experience like that, and these key words, by the way, come up time and time again, hungry, tired, cold, uncertain, frustrated. These push us psychologically to an extreme. They push us to an area where we might do things or say things that we wouldn't do ordinarily. And you might be thinking, well, hey, maybe that patient was sad because they were responding to the medication that you gave them, doctor, and you made them emotional. And that's certainly a possibility. Except in this case, this particular patient walked in without any medication on board. Because if you're walking in, means that you didn't get any medication, because the moment you get any sedative medication, you're being wheeled around either in a gurney or in a wheelchair because you're not stable enough to walk on your own. So the medications were not at fault here. I'm not saying the patient was at fault, but I'm saying it was something within the patients. Yes, Carrie, I agree that warm blankets help. Hi, Jonathan, good to see you on there. And L, yes, warm blankets, I agree with all of you, can help counteract what happens when we are cold. You're 100% correct. Uh, so what comes out in these moments of stress are habits. And I, if there's one thing that I wish every patient and every individual who's not a patient yet could appreciate is how powerful our habits are. Because when we're pushed to those hungry, anxious, uncertain, cold, etc. scenarios, our habits come out. When we're training in medical school and residency for you know, years and years and years, you might have an emergency that comes up in the middle of the night, you haven't slept for 24 hours, you're hungry, you're thirsty, you have to use the bathroom. You can't clock out and say, hey, hold on, I'll be right back. You need to attend to the emergency. What do we practice for all those years? Time and time again, it's repetition, 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 so that even in the moments when we are pushed to those limits, we are still operating at peak efficiency, or at least at an extent that is good enough to save that patient's life. Does that make sense? How it's our habits. We don't rise to our best, we sink to our worst. Therefore, we need to make our worst be excellent. We need to try to be excellent and be our best even when we are at our worst because we can't always control our environments just like that patient who walked in the door here. They walked in, they crossed the threshold. This is the closest you ever get to death. Let's be very clear. Anesthesia is a medical coma. You will never be as close to death, in a controlled environment at least, as you are when you're connected to that ventilator behind me with those medications on board. You are 
right on the edge of death. You are crossing a threshold when you enter this room and, and there's all of this habit that will kick in. So where are your habits? Right? Some of them are nature, some of them are nurture. And this is where resilience comes into play. By the way, I just need to shout out to everyone for these fantastic comments. Heidi, um, Linda, Dan and Janet, good to see you again. Um, we'll answer those questions in a little bit, but I do want to finish the story about this patient because it's so educational for all of us. I do want to let you know that if you appreciate me coming here, even after a long day in the operating room, I'd really appreciate it if you hit that like button and share what you've learned with others. Because as you know, I don't like to do any ads, any product placement. I'm here to help you gain empowerment over your body, take control over your body. Because you have more power over your body than you've probably ever been told. And I want you to be empowered if you ever need to seek medical care. Now, the habits that we have come out when we are hungry, tired, cold, etc. And this is where our habit loops kick in. Our habit loops are, if like this patient was depressed and anxious, so they had inwardly focused loops that were dominated by perseveration and rumination of both the past, which we call depression, and the future, which we call anxiety. Two sides of the same coin. So triggers for this patient triggered inwardly focused loops. Right? That is where this individual fell to the moment they walked into this room, the moment they crossed that threshold. Now, there are many other patients, and, and other videos I, I'm going to talk about them. The Jedi, for example, when they cross the threshold, right? This is the door. It's not like some make-believe thing. Literally, it's a physical threshold that you cross into the unknown, facing the closest thing you will ever face in this world, which is you know, death, in, an opera, in a uh, controlled environment. Their trigger, right, that takes them into their habit loop, is one of outwardly focused curiosity in addition to inwardly focused acceptance and control. So it's not that habits are bad, habits are powerful, but the triggers for our habits need to be mindfully and conscientiously thought out. It's not anyone's fault. I'm not blaming the patient that came in silently crying. My heart went out to them. And it's very important to reach them and meet them compassionately. It's not about blaming, it's about empowering. Even in the worst moments of our lives, like here in the operating room, even if it's not an emergency, patients that come in, even if it's not for emergencies, even for elective surgeries, they can still have these same concerns. They're very, very real. But the question then is, am I born a certain way? You know, people do a lot of personality tests and they come to me, they're like, doctor, I'm an anxious personality type. And you know, I, I know we can jokingly say that in, in um, culturally we say that, but we also run the risk of labeling ourselves and potentially limiting our potential to grow as a human being. Because when we label ourselves as being an anxious subtype or a leader subtype, or a type B personality. Fill in the blank for the label, doesn't matter. When we label ourselves, we're already putting ourselves into a habit type of loop. So that when we get triggered by something, we're gonna fall into that anxious or the introverted personality type or the type B personality type or whatever we've labeled ourselves at before that stressor occurred. I hope that makes sense and it's very profound and it's very simple and very elegant. But this is why, as you know, in my ketamine infusion practice, we are always focusing on what are the loops, the habits, the identities that we associate with. Because in moments of hunger, frustration, being cold, uncertain, etc., that is what manifests, just like this patient in the operating room. Those silent tears broke my heart, and I hope that you appreciate just how we all need to be mindful of those around us because some of us are silently crying all the time. Maybe this was just an outward, an outward exhibition of that because they were pushed to such an extreme, but many of us are hurt on the inside. It's not about blaming, but it's about recognizing. How can we redo the habit loops, the triggers from the external world that hijack our central nervous system 
to put us into spins of rumination and perseveration and ultimately hurting ourselves on the inside like that. I hope that if you know someone who's having surgery, that you can recommend ways that they can take control of their health, like what we talk about on this channel. And even if it's not in surgery, for all the other stressors in life, you have so much power over your health. And I really hope that you never forget that I'm wishing the best for you and that you have that power that you can tap into, but you may have to put your identity and your ego out of the equation to tap in to that beautiful essence that we all have. I believe this. I know in the Western biomedical model, we don't give it much recognition or appreciation, but I believe that every patient who comes on this table with me does bring in something very powerful, but they're often depriving themselves of tapping into it. So with that said, I would appreciate if you hit that like button uh, to support me doing this more for you because it helps uh, support me because I don't want to ever have to push products on you all. Uh, and I want to keep doing this for you and I do want to answer your questions. So uh, let's see, pickles. Can patients ask to wear headphones throughout surgery? You can ask the institution wherever you're at might not comply, but I encourage you to ask. Uh, Irene, uh, let, let's take our focus off ourselves and see others' pain. Yes, Irene, perspective and connection with humanity is, is so important. You know, we're all part of the same tree of humanity, if that's what you believe. How can one branch not feel the pain of another branch being broken on that same tree and still be given the name human? Uh, Catherine, Marco, I tore my bicep and I'm having surgery. Can you walk me through it? Am I asleep? Uh, Catherine, we'll talk about that for sure in a different live stream, I promise. Uh, I know you have a lot of great contributions on this channel, so I want to make sure that we answer your question in a dedicated video. But you will likely be fully asleep, possibly with a nerve block. Courtney says, why? Oh, Courtney Frazier, good to see you again. Why am I so afraid of surgery when I am on medications for conditions like epilepsy? Well, it's probably not because of the medications as much as it is for all the other reasons I'm talking about. The fears, uncertainties, and doubts that thrive when we don't have certainty, control, and confidence. Courtney, but if you're having surgery, I am wishing you the best, of course. Um, uh, let's do two or three more questions. Kelly, I was never scared of surgery until I had a panic attack and now have anxiety and now I get sick in the OR. Kelly, I'm so sorry that you've experienced that. It sounds like it might be an acute stress disorder or PTSD from the experience in the operating room or in the other setting that manifested or that triggered that panic attack. And it goes to show that when we're put into situations, and I, I don't want to keep repeating it, but it's really the same thing you'll find. Hungry, frustrated, tired, annoyed, cold. These push us into places where our inside, whatever is inside our heart, if that's what you believe, is the seat of some part of your existence. May not be, but some people believe that, and I respect that. I personally do to an extent. Those environments allow that to gush out. And sometimes, if we don't have the right coping mechanisms or habit loops to fall back to, they can cause a panic attack. It can cause that intense anxiety, that overwhelming sense of fear, loss, being out of control. So it may have always been there and it takes the right environment to trigger that to come out. I hope, Kelly, that you found professional help for what you've been going through. Sheila, thank you for the kind comments. Um, History of cardiac arrest, I gotta know. I'm very happy that you made it out of two cardiac arrests. Uh, and Blue Omega says that even outside the operating room, mental health is important. I 100% agree. Jessica, good to see you. Good to see you. The one that never called says, I had a wise person tell me before one of my surgeries to let my anxiety go and trust the medical professionals. And it's helped me a lot ever since. Well, that's very powerful the one that never called. And I agree with that. I also recognize that in some cases it's hard for us to embody that when we are pushed to an extreme, like in this operating room right now. And that's why it's important to recognize that for some patients that can be very helpful. And for other patients, they might feel like they're being abandoned or blown off or ignored, even though they're not, right? But this is where cognitive distortions 
cloud, literally cloud, the picture, because as you know, cognitive distortions are our mental filter of what comes into the world and how we, to an extent, choose to interpret it. Whole different topic, but it's very powerful, and you're absolutely correct. Steve, the vein champagne is what always calms me down if I'm struggling with any anxiety. I've been through so many surgeries, two major surgeries, uh, coming up in three weeks. I'm really happy to hear that, Steve. I, I actually want to learn more about that. I've not heard of that. I'm wishing you the best for your upcoming surgeries. And Louis Saris, good to see you on here. Just want to say you guys are an amazing specialty. Oh, well, thank you so much for the kind comments. Uh, Jim Walsh says, I've always wanted to be put under as quickly as possible. Many patients want to do that, and that's not wrong. However, wanting to be under as soon as possible doesn't, I mean, where did my propofol go? I can slam this in very fast, and you'll be asleep very fast, but you still have to wake up to the reality of being in pain, to the reality of being in a cast, the reality of maybe having a colostomy bag, a urostomy bag, being in a brace, and there's many things depending on your surgery. Slamming this in fast may not empower patients to wake up from the table with that sense of self-efficacy, agency, responsibility, and how they're going to recover after. I'm not saying it's wrong to do, but it has to be part of recognizing the whole individual and their whole treatment altogether. With that said, thank you so much for all the kind comments. I wish everyone a good rest of the day and to remember that you have more power over your health. Uh, as always, your support helps me do this more often. And I wish I could thank the person who left the super thanks. I didn't see who it was, but it uh, means a lot. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, remember that you have more power over your health, even in these scary scenarios, more power than you've probably ever been told.